Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac. And with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well. Uh, you know, we're live today, so... We are. Spotlight's on, right? The spotlight is on. But I'm excited for today's show, What the Fact, with Camboard. I thought we were diving right into Nextcloud, but um, one more here. One more for Camboard. Yeah, I, I wanted to at least give it a, a wrap-up, uh, and, and we're going to see if we can't answer some uh, questions that have been floating around and, and give it our best shot and do what we do best, which is just kind of meander around a subject until maybe we arrive at a conclusion. Okay. <laughs> yeah. With that, should we jump into the show here? Yeah, let's do it. Jump into uh, news. You want to you cover this first one here? Free software. It's about much more than zero cost. Yeah, this was just a feel-good article, honestly, but I'm going to pick it up anyways. Uh, the Document Foundation uh, from the, the guys who are maintaining LibreOffice and and the ecosystem around that including collabora which i wanted to to get your opinion on in a minute yeah. here put out an article uh celebrating the free software day uh on february 14th valentine's day yeah i love free software day so they're reiterating the four freedoms and i think this is something that we don't want to lose track of so i wanted to put put it in front of my face again their take on this is when we talk about free software like LibreOffice. We're talking about fundamental freedoms. One, the freedom to run the software as you wish for any purpose. Two, the freedom to study how the program works and change its source code. Three, the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your friends and colleagues. And four, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified version to others so that they can benefit. And they go into a little bit about licensing and and really it's just a, a feel-good uh, article. They end with a pictogram or, or a little picture of pictures of all the free software logos uh, in the shape of a heart and i you know i'm looking at these like oh there's arts you know there's tux there's git there's gnome you know messenger so thunderbird uh, i i just thought that was really cool like i said I'm, I'm a huge fan of infographics um but i am not talented enough to make them so i'll stick to just fawning over them but i i, I did think it was a it was a really good feel good type of article uh, on Valentine's Day. Um, I know I could use a pickup, uh, so pick me up. So that, that was fun to, to see. And then last minute, I threw in the changes to the LastPass free tier subscription uh, article. I just got a minute to read it, and you're going to have to correct me on this if I'm wrong, but what I saw was that basically they, ha they have two versions of their application. They Well, what they're breaking it down to into two versions. It's desktop and mobile. And they're saying, yeah, you can have one or the other, but you can't have both now. You have to pay for both. So you can either be a desktop user and use it only on computers, or you can have it on mobile and only pay for and you know, only use it free on mobile, or you can pay for the service last pass and basically have it on both types of clients they just kind of picked something and rolled with it yeah I'm, I'm i'm not sure where this is coming from um why are they introducing a limitation like let's start there why are they introducing this right now why, why can't they just say going forward they're going to start offering this or we're going to offer you know a premium service with more well that that is tech debt right so that's always going to be frustrating to have to deal with if, if you got to support two different tiers or, or two different revenue models you know one is grandfathered in i mean those that makes for good customer retention and customer relations but for for the back end people working it it's it's going to be a pain so um i'm, I'm sure the techies are happy that they're they're dropping it and and focusing on on one um but i'd be interested to look into you know what's what's going on in the back end i mean how is last passes financials doing you know how is how's their consumption doing how's their uh, retention rate it it sounds like they think they're in a strong place with the amount of people that they have onboarded and are continuing to onboard and would prefer to to push them in one direction or another and you know maybe this is something that they got via their metrics you know they were able to see that hey turns out all the the mobile users just use it on mobile and all the desktop users just use it on desktops so let's split it up there and the people who really want it over multiple channels can do that 
And that's fine. That's that's whatever. And it's not breaking the bank. I don't know if you saw. I think it's two twenty five a user per month. Yeah, and, and and that's almost like that's a really cheap service. And well, we know where they've cheaped out in the past, which is security. And we, I, <laughs> I would rather you know pay more for something that doesn't have a track record of getting hacked once a year. I'd say, what's the alternative that's out there? Bitwarden, of course. Bitwarden, of course, is is what I'm interested in, and and I wanted to take the tact of, yeah, it's you know, it's 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 fairly cheap for a family plan at at LastPass. One of the other kind of art, artificial restrictions that they put up here is the per user, per family member, per number of user restrictions. Obviously, it's because they're acting as a shared hosting service where where you have their one instance or, or their one service hosting all of their clients uh they're they're taking that tech so they're going to sell user by user but that's that's always frustrating especially if you just have a lot of people that have a simple use case right and, and you don't you don't want to uh, pay for like you were talking about the the gitlab subscriptions the gitlab subscriptions are on a once again, on a per user basis. And I think what we're able to offer with our compose is we don't have any of these artificial restrictions on how you use your service, right? You just use your service and, and you don't even have to let us know how you want to use our service unless you have any questions. And then we're here for you to talk about how you want to use your service. Like that's, that's the benefit that you're getting from from something like our composes is you don't have to be worried about oh did i go over you know my allocation and and i'm sure you know i haven't looked into LastPass's features but are they offering something else with their premium package right are they offering additional functionality right once again that's more gatekeeping that just gets in the way of why are you not just offering me the entire experience Right? Why? Why? Why am I not getting the experience of the product that I'm paying for? Because I'm not paying enough. Because you know, you set your price too low. Uh, and and once again, I mean, not only do they have a, a fairly low price in on a per user basis, but but this change here, this changes to the free plan, right? And we've gone over changes to free plans before. The company that you're at is not beholden to you for a free plan. There's no exchange of value. You're basically wasting their bandwidth and compute in exchange for hope that, you know, you're spreading the word or in the future, you're going to influence someone who has the purchasing power in order to do something. That's that's a network effect that they're trying to generate there, which you can you can already see how company after company pushes back against this as soon as they hit some kind of critical mass. There's never any promises attached to what you're actually getting with a, with a free tier, right? I mean, the promise is we're going to allow you to do this today. We'll see about tomorrow. And I would much rather not have to think about that week in and week out. Let's move on to development here. Um, I've got a couple of notes on what we were able to accomplish recently. Um, first of all, uh, we finally were able to come to a resolution on developing automation to fix unhealthy containers. Uh, of course, this is something that touched a lot of moving pieces. And considering the, the whole webhooks discussion and, and polling discussion that we had last episode, there was a lot of logic we wanted to, to work through before we came to, to a conclusion on, on what we wanted to do. Uh, and I think we're in a pretty good place, Jack. When, when you say, or I'm happy with it. Trying to go back and recall how much we touched on in the last episode, because I know we had talked about it specifically, I think around polling versus web hooks, but where we are right now, excited to tell everyone that you are in it with rails got the cracked out the rails logger and we are ready to go we are all ready to go that was fun i was i was absolutely kind of flexing some new muscles there i'm so happy it got implemented i'm i'm we're finally there it finally is healing it's self-healing it's exciting I, i'm i don't know do you, what do you want to add to that i I, feel, I didn't i don't want to dive too deep into the de technical details of it but to do a little impromptu retrospective on this i wanted to have you expand on what you said when you were talking about you're so glad it's it's done right this this i don't know if you want to call it scope creep because i i'm not sure really the scope ever uh, really broadened beyond what the general idea was for this to do but it definitely compounded in complexity 
somehow. So if you wanted to speak to that, yeah. I think it's what you have in your head doesn't always come out on paper the same way. The way I kind of imagined it, at least, was a lot different than the way it kind of panned out. Especially with, going back to last week or last episode, polling and webhooks. Because it was a lot of storing state. A lot of the logic that was there, I would, we broke it down and just overall made it simpler. It wasn't this big complex thing. It didn't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. And and I wanted to get your your thoughts on the process because I think there was a point where you were just done with it. So w- walk us up to that point. Basically, what should have happened is that everything except boilerplate methods and essentially helper methods should have been wiped. And all the logic around when get health report methods are getting called and when post roles are getting called should have been deleted because all the functionality was there, but it was the logic that was basically incorrect. That's easy to say in retrospect. What was your point where you got to? Because I I know there was a point that you just got to like, I am, I don't know where to go from here. I'm, you know, it could have been, I'm, I'm so attached to my code, but then I'm sure there was a point you looked at it and I'm like, the amount of effort I would have to put into working on to this. redo it. Right. Yeah. To redo, to redo it. it. You just go, yeah. So at what point? Yeah. At what point was that? The thing is, it's hard to, it was one of those things that was hard to test. I don't know if you ever felt that way during it. Um, it's something that you kind of have to, it's not a wait and see kind of thing, but it's, we didn't have unit. Te- there was no kind of unit testing for the methods. So with that not being there, it was kind of just a mainly run this and see what happens. I don't know if I'd call that the breaking point, but it was, Right where I thought, all right, I'm storing two things in the database and I should be storing one. Let me run this again and see what happens. And, oh, I got a different result this time. Was that the point where you just felt like you were in over your like, head? You're just like... Yeah, I th- I, there was too much going on with all the states that were kind of occurring. I think there were about five or six different moving pieces between the database, the, you know, bullying conditions. There were, there were a couple of th- there were a lot of things that were being tracked, which um, was kind of, where I was just like, quite honestly, just too much going on right now. Okay. No, that's, that's, that's a good retro. Cool. No, no, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Cause I was wondering, I want to have that talk on air. So awesome. Other one was kind of a little oversight on my end. I remember I was going through the Camboard plugins episode and I was walking through the integrations and I'd spun up a temporary instance to do some demos slash testing on and i realized that plugin installation from the web front end was not enabled by default and in the back of my mind i had known that i i know i had known that and had simply been pushing it off and so i had to go back and enable that in the code luckily it was just a simple environment variable fix i think this is literally a one-line fix and yeah so we've been we've been keeping ourselves busy i know that but uh, I've I've also been diving into a lot of content creation, and that's been helping me catch some of these things as well. And uh, I know that I wanted to step back uh, as we wrap up Canboard, you know, because because we've covered a lot, we've covered a lot. Uh, so I wanted to to take a step back and do a Q and A session. So let's let's go through uh, this this Q and R. This will be the substitute for our uh, integration discretion and uh jack i will let you lead it however you want so if you want me to ask you questions or if you want to ask me questions go for it okay i'm gonna go ahead and ask you questions i put together let's see here about 12 and they're they're kind of easy some of them have one word answers some of them have two word answers you can elaborate as much as you want or as little as you want and i know i had put out something to the podcast feed asking uh, for Q and A, and I put that out really late. I didn't see any responses trickle in. If anyone out there does have any additional questions, it's not like this is the end of us ever talking about Camboard ever. So if if you if something if this sparks a question for your, for anyone out there, or if you just run across something in your day to day, feel free to reach out, and and we're more than happy to to help out uh, with with this stuff. I mean, this is this is what we do. All right. What is the best plugin? I I would say the calendar one. Uh, I would say the calendar one simply because 
I think it gives me it, it's it's great to have that separate tab. It gives it an air of professionalism. It gives Camboard an air of professionalism that comes with having that built right in. Especially if I want to see what is going on in my day. Now it does have an iCal feed that I export to my phone, so it's not like I would be without that. However, it is probably the first thing I install. Uh, on a Camboard instance. Okay, I, I'm going in a different direction with that one. I'm going Nebula. I'm going with a theme. I don't know if that is anti-productivity or what. I'm going with a theme, man. That, that that way I'm able to log in and go, all right, I can actually look at this. Well, and, and that's a good point too, especially since you're logging into the browser via your your mobile device. So like on my desktop, yeah, I have Dark Reader. Um, and we'll, we'll actually get into that later, but... That's going to give me a default dark theme on all the web pages, but Nebula being specifically crafted for Camboard, it's a little bit more polished. Does Cal does Camboard work with my existing calendar? So you said you, you said you have iCal, right? I did put that up there. Yeah, uh, Camboard by default has the option to export iCal feeds. Uh, I think they are only either public or not available. Uh, I'd have to double check. I know that. I actually subscribe to it via Nextcloud and then aggregate all of my calendars in Nextcloud. And that's what's actually being displayed on my phone. But the, yeah, the, the iCal is available through, through Canboard. And, and that's something that can work with Google Calendar, that can look, work with Outlook, that can work with, you know, any, anywhere you have your calendar, right? All you would do is import the, the Canboard feed. Uh, in order to work with that. So that's one of those features you're like, well, I'm using a board system. Why do I need a calendar, right? All the purists out there would say, why do I need a calendar? It's like, well, you have due dates for stuff. You live in the, we live in a society. You're going to have due dates for stuff. Um, and, and something I've been playing around a little bit more with is like the uh, the start date and, and the due date. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't even think about setting start dates and configuring those with, I guess, lining them up with calendar. You could also do where you have a subtask due date and like your subtask would be to read the next chapter in the book and then you would go to the study the next day and then the global due date for that task would be that Friday due date. There's there's different ways to do it um, and honestly that's that's what I love about Camboard. It is so bare bones that there's whatever works like especially when it comes to your calendar system it's like whatever works for that and you know there's there's other things I want to do to the calendar too. The one drawback for the calendar which I've actually started taking a look into is that it does not produce events that alert by default so you would actually have to go in individually wherever your calendar is and flick whatever task is is there to alert and it yeah enable the alert on the task and i would like to do something because the iCal specification has a way where you can specify hey this should be an alert 30 minutes before the activity or something like that and that would go along with the event into the calendar software that you use so that whatever calendar alert notification you have that would pop up as an alert rather than just sitting in the background on your calendar without an alert uh, so that's something i've been playing around with um, but i think i think the calendar is an integral feature of any productivity software because calendars have been used ever since we've been tracking time definitely i i'd agree i think that you need a calendar you need some kind of calendar integration what is the best way to track productivity on Camboard. Would you say complexity? That's another one of yours. So I think I think the hard thing, especially with tasks completed, if we want to start there, I mean that that would be the very first thing. Honestly, if you don't have any metrics, start there. Once once you start getting feedback or 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 hearing that little voice in the back of your head saying, "Well, that one task was actually really big," you got to stop yourself immediately and say, "What do I mean by big?" And that's it's very hard to quantify. Not only is it hard to quantify, it's harder to quantify up front. Uh, and and you and I kind of give estimations, you know, in in complexity. But I think any kind of analytics should be generating statistics based on behavior, not based on guesses or estimations. So if if you're going to be computing some type of 
statistic for for long term or, or you want it to be the holy grail of statistics you're going to have to measure something that naturally happens so for instance one thing that i'm doing trying out at at work is i'm going to be tracking time where the task is active and by active I mean, has been commented on, moved, or updated somehow in the past like day and a half or, or three days. And then if that's happened, then I know that at least someone's looking into it and writing notes or, or doing something on it, moving it back to waiting or moving it back to in progress because something's happening on it. You know, they're, they're actually touching that task. You know, they're, they're, I've started to, I've started to, refer to uh at work jira i've started to refer to it as like my zen rock garden where i just keep i keep moving stuff around and smoothing out the boards and you know it's it's a daily kind of level set for myself just to kind of shift everything around and yeah i'm still working on this or if i haven't touched something you know and and i do have a filter currently out there that i'm testing just you know what is a what is a stale task look like you know and a stale task in a, in a different state you know if something's waiting that could probably be waiting for weeks it isn't necessarily going to be stale after a day or two whereas something in progress is absolutely stale if i haven't touched it in a day or two so making that determination and then saying all right throughout the life cycle of this task from from when it was created to when it was done how often was it stale right and how often was it being worked on and then you can say, well, if if there were five days where it was within that that stale frame of reference, then you know you can assign that like a three complexity or something, right? Um, if there's something that was continuously being touched for three weeks straight, then that's that's a really big task. But if so, if it's something that's sat in planning for for forever, and then moved got moved over, worked on immediately, and then reviewed and done all within like a day and a half, that's a very, very, very small task. So monitoring that on the back end is going to be a lot more effective than monitoring it on the front end. And tracking the productivity that way is going to give you a more natural outcome of, of statistics. But but the first thing you have to do is start measuring what tasks are getting done. Uh, the second is what do we think is getting done versus what's actually getting done. And, and that's kind of what we're doing with complexity. You know, we say, hey, I think this is going to take me three twentieths of my time over the next two weeks. Right. And because because we aim for for 20 complexity every two weeks. So I, I, I say it's going to take three three twentieths or five twentieths. Right. And and kind of chalk it up there. Uh, the, the good thing about keyboard tasks is I have all that data in there so that when I'm ready to start getting a, a, a more natural approach to gathering those analytics, then I can go in and I can say, hey, I think I want to start measuring complexity versus the stale and and all of those all of those transitions are noted. So like I can tell you exactly when the task moved from one column to another. I can tell you exactly when. The complexity was updated uh, or, or, or downgraded. I can tell you exactly when a comment was made. So I can start tracking those, assigning whatever kind of arbitrary boundaries that I want between stale and not stale. And then we start looking into, you know, all right, how much actual work was put into this task? And, and that's why I'm a big proponent of make sure, you know, if you, if you want to track hours, then log your hours there. If you want to track state, then make sure you put a comment in there updating on, you know, what you did that day or, or, or jotting down some notes. Just always be in those tasks. Be be in them. Like let them let them guide your workflow. Here's one for you then. Uh, I have another question that's on the bo on the list here. Is Camboard a good way to document work as compared to like a knowledge base? Like for documentation and for, you know, attaching PDFs and for what have you. Basically comparing it to a knowledge base. Because I could see it going both ways. Rule of thumb, no. Uh, Camboard is not a documentation silo. That needs to be, that needs to live somewhere else. Uh, because, uh, and, and I wouldn't even say, because I was, I was thinking about when you were asking that, I was thinking about, well, 
could it be a way to disperse that information among a team? And yeah, if I attached a PDF and told someone to review it, they would review it and look at the PDF. But the thing is, that's not where, where it's documented. That's not what they would refer to. That's not what you need them to be familiar with. You need them to be familiar with the documentation. So if you're going to introduce anyone to a subject matter, you want to introduce them to the one canonical place that they're going to go to get their information. What do you think the first task that should go in any cam board is? I, I, for me, this answer was uh, set up my cam board. I actually, I like, I like at least coming to the table pre my first task with my columns and swim lanes set up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, and, and, you know, we received this advice when we started podcasting. I mean, you want to start with a solid 25 episode subjects. Like you don't want to jump in here and say, well, maybe I could eke two or three of these out and they would be, you know, decent. And, and I'm sure I could have some subject matter that I could cover for maybe 45 minutes. And then I don't know what I do, right? If you're going to start a podcast, everyone knows that a podcast is going to be like a weekly or bi-weekly or monthly kind of thing where you're going to be expected to have a, have a show with, you know, similar type content over and over and over again. And obviously it's, it's not going to take off immediately. Nothing ever works like that. So you're going to have to put in a lot of effort, you know, to get to, that first kind of bit of momentum with boards. I think it's, it's a similar thing. I don't start a board until I have at least like five or six different things I want to throw on there. Uh, and, and sometimes actually, so for example, uh, when so at I, that point, why track them on the board when you can use a list, if it's only five or six, right. Or would you go more than that? Cause at what point do you say, at what point do you say why board and why now? Right. Versus the list. If you have five or six, I, Cause I just default to the board now. I do default to the board. Yeah. But what I don't do is I don't default to creating new boards. So one of my experiences. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. One of my experiences, uh, was actually moving in here with my roommate and, and, uh, th obviously it being a house, there's a lot of things that need to get done around it. So I thought I'd set up a new board, kind of throw everything that needed to get done on around the house on there and set up a rotation, set up automated tasks, reoccurrences, yada, yada, yada. Well, turns out there's not as much as I thought there was going to be on a weekly or daily or monthly basis. So the, the small amount of tasks that I actually keep track of for, for stuff around the house uh, or, or stuff having to do with, you know, living here, stuff I'm responsible for, um, or just laundry, I track on my personal board. So I just, I just leave it, you know, obviously it's not, it's not this, it's not work stuff. It's not other stuff. I, I just, I just track it on my personal board and it, it fits in there just fine. So what I did is I, I went into a, a brand new board having, you know, maybe five or six different tasks, tried it out, found that it wasn't really buying me anything more than I, I already have on the personal board and just kind of threw all those tasks back on the first board and closed out the, the new one. Cause I, I just did not need it. Do you have a default swim lane then in your personal board? Do you have something where you throw under like the miscellaneous task that ends up being whatever it is, you know, whatever kind of comes up? Yeah, I, I actually, so I have the same four that we use. I have uh, the emergency, which is, you know, if I get an email that my credit cards, expired or I, you know if i if i if i get an emergency i throw it on top uh if i have a one-off like we just had a uh uh men's retreat at work you know and that's not something that happens all the time and it's you know something i'd prepare for so i threw that in the the one-off column or one-off swim lane excuse me uh, and then I have my reoccurring swim lane and then I have my project slash improvement swim lane at the bottom. So it's, it's the exact same setup that you and I are working with. Uh, I, I, I feel that that has been far and away the most flexible setup, uh, that I've ever adopted. Obviously it's, it's very general and some of what I've been doing could benefit from more specifically tuned board structures. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think once again. I think 
the return on investment for me to create another board is just really not there for me to spend all the time and effort. You know, that would be another iCal that I'd have to sync to Nextcloud. You know, so so there's there's just a lot that that goes into maintaining that board. So I figure, hey, it's it's fine as it is. It's I'm getting it done, and that's that's what I'm tracking too. If if I'm sitting there and something's just not getting done, and I, I can identify that, then yeah, that something needs to change. But if if tasks continue to get done and I'm able to track those and, and see a, you know, keep maintaining that forward momentum, I'm not going to fix something that's not broken. With that, I don't have any more questions. I, I think we covered the majority of them that are out there. The third one that I jotted down here, you mentioned the why why not default to a list? At six tasks. And, yeah, and, and that you would default to a board. What would be the rationale for tracking your tasks using a board instead of a list? It helps you track state, where stuff is. You know, am I waiting on something else to complete before I can do this? Is this something I'm working on actively right now? Or is this something that I need, you know, kind of need to do? And it, it, it breaks down to actually those three, those three columns. It's to do, doing, and done. It's hard for me to track state with a list. So what happens for me and why I don't use lists is actually that if I create a list, what will happen is I'll end up with more tasks and create a different list with more tasks on the second list than the first one. And the first one will have about four things, you know, say the list is the first list is eight items long. I'll cross four off and then I'll have four left to go. And then instead of referring back to the new list and creating more on that first list, what I'll do is I'll just create a new list and go to my second list because I couldn't complete the four on my first list and I'll knock off, you know, chip away at the easy tasks and then the long, long lead time items I end up either not coming back to, or I scrap the list or it's, I never end up following up is what happens with that. The to do list, at least for me. So having it on the board, you know, I'm at least able to say, this is, this is right here for now. This is waiting for now. This is basically, I, I'm able to track it better. No, that, that state is very important. I'm wondering how your tasks get on your board. Since you were you were talking about uh, you have one list that turns into another list and you keep rearranging these lists and, and adding new things to the list. How how do you have new things that get onto your board? How do you, how do you have new tasks? Usually if I see, uh, shoot, even YouTube videos and anything that I think would benefit from me either coming back to that I don't have time to immediately complete. I, I don't know. I think it was you that mentioned this once at one point in time. If it's a two minute task, I'll usually just do it. If it's something that's going to take me 20 minutes or longer, I'll create a task for it. I usually, if it's longer than 20 minutes, I, I don't have too many things that are longer than 20 minutes. Uh, or shoot, you know, it's not like I'm spending days or weeks. Um, I'll create like a, a retreat would be a good, good example of that. I'd create a task for it, but it's obviously it's going to break down in a way more than it, it, it's a couple of days. Either way, there's a task out there for it. anything longer than two minutes is essentially going to get a task. If I can do it in two minutes, it's going to be, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit down and do it right now. Just spitballing scenarios here. And I'm sure I'm going to come up with the several, several. So like, say you're, you're in a meeting, right? And you're just, you're spitballing ideas with people, you know, how, how do you capture that output of the meeting i try to go notes through the meeting and then it, well it's for work at least I'll, I'll go notes through the meeting and then after if there are action items i'll take the action items and go task but for you and me oddly enough i do it a little bit differently with you and me if we're sitting there spitballing i'll actually just go to a task because you're pretty good about saying hey let's we need a task for this we just default to hey go make a task rather than coming back to it at the end and saying, all right, what do we need to, you know, what do we need to create a task for? And, and actually I think both approaches are valid. Um, also I like to default when I'm in a meeting to having a task that is relevant to that meeting. So for instance, if I'm in one of my, one of our weekly project meetings, right? We have a task for that. I have at work, I have actually one task per project that just kind of hangs out there in a separate state, a separate board, separate, you know, we track projects there. I don't expect them to, I expect them to stay there for months. Right. 
but I expect all my notes to be there. So I can go back and, you know, what project am I working on? Okay, this is my, you know, this project. So I pull up that one and then I'll make notes in there from all my meetings. You'll see all of my meetings have notes and I can refer back to, oh yeah, two weeks ago we told, you know, someone to, to take a look into this and there was an outcome and then this task was created. So I can go back in my notes through that, that one overarching project and then all of the tasks themselves are, are linked to that project. Uh, so that's what I that's where I like to keep my notes and then tasks as an action item come out of that. But I think I think meetings are interesting in that they do require you to have either the discipline to sit back and say, yes, that's something we should consider and make it as a task, or we're just spitballing here. Let's circle back to it later, but put it as a comment in what we're working on. That that for me is interesting. Um, another scenario, right? You're walking around the grocery store and you have an idea for a YouTube video that you want to look up when you get home. What do you do? Write it down because I know I'll forget it by the time I get home. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what if it's what if it's a bigger project? So I'll write it in just notes as crazy as that sounds. And then I'll come home and do a manual transfer. No, I don't let that get unwieldy because it's very easy to just say, all right, I operated out of notes. It's like, no, you, you can't, you can't have a to-do list out of notes and you should absolutely not have a to-do list out of your inbox. Those are my two no-nos right there, right there. And that's 99% of the people that I've encountered because that's just, the first thing that comes to mind is I get email and I take notes. So that's how I should do my work. And it's like, no, you, you shouldn't. That's data ingest. You should not, you should not track. You should not do project management out of data ingest. But yeah, I think, I think capture is important. Um, and, and I've seen people who use notebooks and, and that's great in a professional setting because you're probably always going to have that around. You know, it's it's going to be there. Um, I actually recently went into a tire place uh, for someone else's car, luckily. And, you know, I, I saw the guy on the phone. You know, is is one guy, three phones. They're all ringing. You know, he's got papers all over the place. And I'm like, this guy has a system. Like, I guarantee you he has a system right? You, you don't just, you know, end up there by mistake. Well, okay. You could end up by the mistake, but like you don't operate a successful business by mistake. So what, you know, what, what is his kind of system? And, and he had, he had his way of making notes per, per call and being able to follow up on them. Like, I don't, I don't know where he was storing it, but you know, he, he had a, a data ingest, you know, whether it's a data in just from a thought he had or from a customer coming in or an email that that popped up you know that was that was his data in just and getting it out of there into somewhere i think is the first step that you need to take right in order to track tasks as opposed to just flailing around indiscriminately sure right however fun it can be to uh flare flail around <laughs> Running around like a chicken with your head cut off. <laughs> a couple good quotes I'm going to hold on to out of that one. But yeah, with that, do you want to drop into a uh, grab bag here? Talk about browser plugins. Did you recognize any or? Yes, actually quite a few. So I didn't recognize JSON on Viewer. I recognized actually all of them except HTTPS Everywhere and JSON Viewer. And maybe that's because I'm on Firefox. No. So Firefox is a web API plugin architecture now which is similar to the blink engine that chrome runs on so everything should be i mean it's different setups but most plugins now are packaged for both and there's there's almost no difference between the two of them uh it's it's small small differences between the two yeah you're, you're gonna i'm gonna have to look, pull up some of these as you're going through them um i recognize vimium dark reader you, you black origin you matrix i actually run every single one except JSON viewer and HTTPS everywhere. But I thought now by default, everything was HTTPS. I, I thought I was being forced into that. I, I don't know if that was, maybe that was Chrome. I, I still, I still run it. Granted, it is a holdover from 
several years ago. So I'm not I'm not sure exactly how relevant is there it is in there, but it's it's still actively pushed. I mean, it's it's still uh, it's it's not been deprecated yet. I mean, it's uh, and, and and it does a couple things too. Um, one of the one of the things it does that I like is that it for 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 all the scripts that are embedded in a website. If anything is trying to reach out over HTTP, it will intercept that and check if there is an HTTPS available. So it's not simply the website page. It is everything within the website that is reaching out. All those other networks. I mean, you open up the inspect tab, you're going to see a whole bunch of network connections going out. And HTTPS everywhere will make sure that if available, it reaches out over HTTPS. So that's that's one I've just kind of kept in my back pocket ever since I started really curating it. The other one out there I wasn't familiar with was QR code generator. Not a big not a big QR uh, QR code guy. I wasn't either until I started running Opera on my Android on my phone. Yeah, the cool thing is is it's got a QR reader built into the URL bar. So Android is not like Apple, where you can literally scan anything with with Apple and it will pop up the the link and in whatever and open it in Safari. But QR code generator is perfect on the desktop when I have something on there that I want to take with me or I want to whatever I can scan it simply with my phone and then boom, it's up on my browser. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to have to start using that for that exact reason. Cause I'm actually on opera on mobile as well. And I didn't even think about that, you know, taking it on the go with me. That's my, that's my number one use case for it. When I'm literally too lazy to type it in or send it as a link via like matrix or something. Or, or even save it in, in Flockus, which is my bookmark manager, which is a great transition because I also use Flockus, which, which I could. I mean, it, if, I saved, if I saved a link as a bookmark to Flockus, then it'd be available to me via Nextcloud because Flockus syncs up my bookmarks. I'm not sure if it's immediate. I think it's, I have it syncing like every 15 minutes or something. But... Exactly. Yeah. So, so Flockus will will sync it up to Nextcloud for me, and I have the uh, the Android companion app on on my phone. Uh, that companion app is not good. Let me tell you that it is. It it doesn't have any sense of hierarchy, which is explicitly built into how bookmarks work. I mean, you have folders of bookmarks, and and this thing just completely ignores that and just presents it to you. You know, completely uh, flat. Yeah, treeless. Here's everything. So it's not, it's not great. Okay. Uh, but especially for browser to browser sync, like when I'm doing stuff on my laptop and doing stuff on my desktop, if I'm taking my laptop anywhere, I don't want to not have all my bookmarks. That's, that's a losing strategy right there. And there's no way to USB sync. No, no, let's, just, let's stop right there. We're not doing anything crazy here. All we're doing is, is using Nextcloud and, I'm sure over the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll bring this up again, but we're using this for, oh, I'm using this for book bookmark management uh, and, and it works just fine. Um, I'm, I'm completely happy with it. The advantage of the QR code generator though, is it actually pops up with a box with anything in it. Uh, so you can actually paste not just the URL of the website, which it defaults to, but you can paste literally anything in there. That's what I was looking at when I clicked. When I clicked the link, I was like, oh, it's just text. You can type in anything you want and it's going to show up here. I'm sure what it's 20, is it 2048 bytes? I don't know. I, I, I have actually not delved into QR code tech yet. I haven't, that's not been something I've ever had to touch. So I couldn't tell you, but I, I found it handy, you know, every now and again. And that's, that's good enough for me to, to throw down there and have that running. So I go pocket. I don't know if you've heard of pocket as the other one. I want to say that's by Mozilla. Mozilla acquired it. It is not open source. Okay. Didn't know that one. Unaware of that one. I'd used it. I had used it. I'll tell you what, anymore though, I if I need to read something on my desktop, I'm bad about tab management. Well, I know we're not getting there yet, but I keep about a thousand tabs open on uh Firefox. So I think I'll make a convert of you today then, but we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I keep about a thousand tabs open. If it's something really worth reading, guess what I'll do? 
create a task for it. If it's something I need to come back to and read, create a task for it. But um, yeah, do you wanna I, I do you wanna jump into these JavaScript ones, JavaScript blocking? Because I know I, do, I have those two, and those those are some of my favorite. Yeah, U Block Origin and U Matrix. So U Block Origin was the big ad blocker to come out uh, uh, right after the the big ad blocker boom, like ad block plus, especially once that got bought out by an advertising company wasn't it i think it was there were some shenanigans yeah yeah there were some shenanigans around that so out popped you black origin by raymond hill i think it is uh and and either way it's a it's a simple ad blocker that tries to block ads it's really straightforward and it, it does a really good job of it so i don't see you know I, I i don't think i need to get into this other than for the love of all that is good, block the ads. Like that's, I don't care if I'm value signaling here or whatever. Like that's, ads are not good. So like Facebook has like a super cookie out. Not like the super cookies from like two years ago, but like an ultra super cookie now. And that's why I run cookie auto delete. So, and and and, and I take the three approaches, right? So I, I do the ad blocker, great. The second thing I do is I do U matrix, which is basically just a more granular, ad blocker because it not only blocks that but it blocks any kind of third-party scripts unless you explicitly enable them now this is a pain in the butt because it breaks like 50 percent of the internet now it's really easy to use once you get up and running with it and especially after you've saved a couple of preferences on your default sites you end up realizing that hey i really only go to the same like 20 to 30 sites and after that, you know, it's all like article clickbaity and the, a lot of the pop-ups and stuff get blocked by U-Matrix. Uh, but I would not recommend U-Matrix for anyone who's not a techie or at least interested in kind of trying to figure out what's going on with this. It's, you know, it's for people who like to tinker with their browser, not people who just want it to work. If you just want it to work, just use U-Block Origin. That's sufficient. The cookie auto delete though, the cookie auto delete is a different beast in that if we understand cookies to be session tokens and generated after a specific login, what cookie auto delete does is every time you've not had that website open for a set amount of time, and I think it's like five minutes that you're logged in, it'll go ahead and wipe that cookie. So it will get rid of that because what websites do is they request all of your cookies so that when when you go to a separate website, it sees every other website that has given your browser a cookie and every other site you, that you're currently logged into, every other site that you've been at or registered at or, or anything is going to be handed over to any random website on the web that you visit. So I have the plugin. I have the browser plugin for cookie auto delete. But you know what? Now that you say this and mention it, I don't think I have it auto deleting. And maybe because the only reason I say this is I, I've burned myself many a times on clean all. So I have auto clean disabled right now. And then there's a, a button that I have that's a clean include open tabs and it just wipes everything. I've burned myself many a times clicking that like, all right, I need to delete cookies from this. Get rid of everything. But kind of just get rid of everything. I need to just clear, clear cook, new cookies. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I need to nuke it for the site. I can't get in. I think I locked myself out somehow in some way. I always manage to just nuke everything in my browser. I'm like, oh, here I am logging into Bitwarden and it doesn't know anything about it. So here we go again. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, that's where you have to take a look and see all right what what do i actually need to do and a lot of the sites that i go to if i see that i'm logging in you know two or three or four times i'll want to make sure to whitelist those and 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 that's you know how how the plugin works is that you know once you know that you want to keep a login for something even when you're not visiting it uh you would you would just whitelist uh whatever site that you want to log on to and then that doesn't get cleaned again because that's whitelisted so once again it's like U Matrix. I'd say that's probably the in between of U Matrix and U Block Origin in complexity, because U Block Origin is an ad blocker that's just hands off. Uh, U Matrix is you really got to get down deep in there. 
uh, cookie auto delete is right in the center there where it's like, yes, show me everything or, you know, wh whitelist cookies on this page forever. You know, just, I don't want to worry about it. I don't ever want to worry about my cookies getting deleted from this. Just, just whitelist it. Uh, and that takes care of it forever. That's, that's been pretty solid for me. Uh, and, and those are my, my three big privacy, uh, plugins. All good ones. I have all of them. Now, I'm glad you said something about cookie auto delete because I don't think I have it enabled right now. I have it on there, but I don't think I have it enabled. Well, the most reassuring thing is like the notifications that pop up. After a bit of time, you're like, oh, I didn't even know that site stored cookies on my browser. I'm glad they got deleted, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so you'll see those popping up every now and then. You're like, oh, what a dumb website. <laughs> you feel sweet. It's like, yeah, I just... I outsmarted you. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Goodbye cookies. And you were, you were talking about Bitwarden too. Do you, do you have the plugin? Yeah. I know we were discussing it. I do have the, so I have the plugin. The, the, the plugin is, is super handy for me at least because it, it does leave me logged in um, while I'm browsing around the web. Like even if I hibernate my machine, it'll stay uh, open. But if I lock it, it will lock as well. Yeah. If I hibernate, it won't because a hibernate is just like freezing the entire computer. But if I lock the screen, it will lock the Bitwarden instance. So is that a time? Is that on a timeout then? Because mine was always unlock, and I don't know what that was due to. There is a setting. Yeah, there's a there's a setting. Usually, if you reboot and or lock your screen or something else operating system wide, it will catch that and lock itself. Because mine mine was very odd where it was every time. I, I essentially, you know, click on the plugin and, it, you know, it gives a drop down. It was hit unlock right now. It's like, all right. But I mean, that's if you're sitting on your computer all day, that's what you want, though. Like, I don't want that to lock every 20 minutes because that's just annoying. annoying. Right. And that's what it was doing for me. Yeah. So, so and, and it could have been it could have been a set. I, I know that there is a setting in order to set that I can have it close itself every five minutes if I wanted to chances are i don't want it to i'll tell you right now i don't want it to but yeah no that's that's been that's been super handy uh and and i use that all the time i use that all the time and actually the other one i use all the time is going to be dark reader and dark reader you'll even see it on some of the integration sessions that i have uh i was i was talking about installing nebula on camboard and I was like, well, just imagine this is all white because I have a global dark theme going on right now. And I don't feel like killing my eyes. So I just I just left it on. And it's honestly the best thing since sliced bread. Yes, it does take up a sizable amount of CPU on something underpowered like a MacBook Air. But it is so worth it because the internet was made to be dark. Tim Berners-Lee made a mistake. And this is the way it should be, and I'm bringing it back. It, it's it's honestly so much better, and it works it works everywhere. And not only does it work everywhere, but where it doesn't work, it has like six other different operating operating processes or, or just just different ways to operate. You know, it has it has so many different ways to operate in case the default doesn't work, and you can try again and, and load your browser. Uh, you can load your page in another version, and it is it has just been rock stable for me and i'm just so happy with it i get i get comments all the time especially when i'm screen sharing at work or something someone's like i didn't know it had a dark theme i'm like it doesn't but i do how about that throw everyone for a loop yeah so do you enable it for every site so what i do i don't know why i do this i enable it for there's like a whitelist for sites does that sound right and i have it on and off i can i do it site by site you can whitelist or blacklist uh, depending on how you want to approach it. I blacklist and I say that anything that's not on my exceptions site can get put through. Like for instance, our, our Camboard instance is on the exceptions list because I want the Nebula theme because that's already dark mode. Exactly. So I just use a Nebula theme and, and turn, our, turn off Dark Reader for that site. Yeah. But the... The dark reader is turned on everywhere else. Uh, even rcompose.com, like our main, our, 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 our composecast.com even, uh, I have the dark mode on. Even though it's dark mode by default, I'm like, ah, it's too much hassle to just leave dark mode on. Um, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love it, and I would never go back to a white screen ever again, ever. No turning back.
not even with su- with sunglasses. The other thing that that helps me when I'm viewing, you know, for for not having to really kill myself when I'm taking taking a look at, at at internet data is especially when I'm working with APIs, I work with a lot that are returning JSON objects. And I can access a lot of them in my browser. But if you've ever tried to, uh, it spits out literally one long line of JSON, which is incomprehensible. Firefox does not do that. No, Vivaldi and Chrome blink based browsers do. Yeah. So what I've added is the JSON viewer, which anytime it detects JSON, it will automatically format it and it's dark theme. So, so, so still no whiteness and I'm able to, to view a very sane representation of JSON. It does the same as, you know, Python's P print that we were talking about earlier. Very, very happy about that. Actually, one of my, uh, one of my coworkers turned me on to that. He was uh, showing me stuff in his browser. He was like, he's like, here, I got something for you. So that was, that was fun. Um, and then the one thing that I recommend to cowork, well, not everyone. I, I can't even recommend it to everyone because not everyone is learnt in the ways of Vim and VI. So for those who are though, I highly recommend Vimium. Uh, it is exactly what you would want out of a browser based interface that emulated a uh, VI and nothing more. Uh, for instance, I think uh Vimperator was the one I was initially trained on and that was, that was very low level. You, you put in a lot of low level commands in order to get it to, to tweak. And, and there was just a lot of intricacies as to how it actually worked in the browser. Now, Vimium is a lot more cut and dry, and this is how we're going to do things and live with it. And it's it's brilliant. I mean, it's you can yank tabs, you can follow links. Uh, my favorite thing in Vimium, if you know Vim at all, you know that uh, capital G goes to the bottom of any given file, and two lowercase g's is the keyboard shortcut to go to the very top of the file. So I use that in a browser all the time. If I'm like in the middle of the article reading or whatever, I want to go back up to the top. It's two keystrokes instead of, you know, scroll, 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 scroll. And keep in mind, I'm dealing with script output like in my automation front end, like run deck it has a lot of lines of output. If I wanted to go all the way to the top, that would be a very annoying to scroll all the way to the very top. Grabbing the scroll bar on the side, you know, is still a, a pain, right? Because I got to stop everything I'm doing and go back there. You know, literally all I got to do is GG and I'm back to the top of the page. And there is, that, that to me is amazing. So I am just very happy with that. I use that more than anything uh, else in Vimium. But I use a, a whole lot of other uh, shortcuts in, in, in Vimium too. So it's been... It's been great having that, and it keeps my Vim chops up to date too. So I'm can't complain, can't complain. I was gonna say, so I think it's Vimperator. That was the old one. Yes. So is Vimium supported now? Vimium is supported. Vimperator was uh, deprecated when Firefox switched to the web API. I uh, use Vim- Vimperator on on Firefox. Uh, there is a spiritual successor in Pterodactyl, which implements a lot of the same things, not all of them. So I I actually did end up wanting something simpler, and Vimium is exactly fits a bill, you know. So so I installed that, played around with it, never looked back. I should look back though. It's Vim is one of those things where you always gotta go back to the documentation, right? Because you're you're only going to figure out how to do something if you if you're so annoyed with a problem that you're so fed up that you're actually willing to read the documentation one of the plugins well in in fact the plugin that i think i was the saddest about going away when firefox switched over their plugins api was tab groups what tab groups did was gave you Different, different groupings, um, extensible, you know, renameable, whatever, right? That you could select to hide or show different tabs, and you really could only show one one group at a time. 
and you would also be able to view all of your pin tabs. So, so what ended up happening was I would have Firefox and uh, I would have a couple pin tabs, probably, you know, one of them was my board. One of them was where I was playing music out of, and the rest of them was a specific task, right? So like I grouped them by cam board task. So I would have, I would have one task and then every time I needed to open up a new tab because of that task to do more research or to find out something or to, to search something, I would open it under that same tab group. And then when I wanted to switch context switch to a new task, I would open up a new task and create a new tab group with just that task in it. So I didn't have all of my old cruft of all my old tabs open. Literally the only thing I had was that new task. And, and that's what I mean by I let my tab, I let my tasks lead me in my workflow. So I started off with literally just the task and then all of my tabs that were open, I knew were relevant to that one task, right? And then if I were to switch to another task, that would that would be a whole new other set of tabs. That got deprecated whenever the web API switch was, and that was several years ago by now. And there just had not been any replacement for that. Uh, you can see some of my comments on, on one of the Mozilla bug trackers. Uh, there's other things in, in GitHub repos. There's just literally, there was no replacement for that. That is just a functionality that they straight up deprecated without a good replacement. My workaround was in Vivaldi. Uh, on my desktop, I could open up a new window, you know, with my one task and then use all of that. But yeah, but... But then, once again, I would have to switch back to other windows to control my, my main board and my music, and I couldn't see the other things I had open. And, and uh, you can't rename windows, and, and it, was, it was just, it wasn't as fluid as before. And that was always my big gripe. For years, I've had this gripe. For years, I've been slowly, you know, brewing and just holding this contempt deep, dark down inside of me. And I was like, this... This is dumb. They they took me my you know one awesome plugin. I was so angry, so angry. Uh, and to my surprise, Vivaldi took tabs to the next le level, literally. Uh, so if you you take a look at the the second link uh, that I I pulled up here, they introduced functionality uh, inside of their tab stack existing functionality to add literally another set of tabs to your browser. So if you have like one one bar that's all of your tabs, like you, you got your tab, your tab bar at the top of your browser, right? Well, for me, it's on the right-hand side because I'm a hacker. But, you know, if you have all your, your tabs on, your, on the top, like a normie, literally there's a second row of them and... You get to you get to play around with those two rows. Now it's not exactly as interchangeable as it sounds, and I don't know if they have a good. Let me see if they have a good walkthrough. They've got some great pictures here, which does not help for a podcast. That's our podcast, man. Do you, you should see these pictures. These pictures are excellent. Let me put it that way. They are. I got the. I have the uh, page open right now. The, the first thing that Vivaldi did was tab stacks, and, and that was sort of close. So what tab stacks are is you have multiple tabs contained within one tab, right? And so one tab represented, you know, maybe like three or four or whatever. And that was great, but I couldn't see them, right? So every time I wanted to select a different tab in, inside of that tab stack, I would have to go to the first one and reopen all the other tabs and see which where they were. And, there wasn't a good visual representation for that, even though the grouping was there and you could rename the tab stacks, you could change the colors on them, I think, too. You know, you could you do all this customization for tab stacks, but they weren't visually represented. So what Vivaldi has done is they have taken those tab stacks and made them, you know, had, they, they, they now have the ability to simply live at the second level instead of only living when you highlight over the one tab and they're now displayed now they're they can be constantly displayed on the second level uh, which means i can have my first main tab with you know five or six because that's actually all my boards tabs right so i have literally all my boards open there and i have named it 
boards, right? So there are all my boards, my personal board, my workout board, my prayer bar board, my R Compose board. They are all under there. And I know if I want to open up a new task or get an overview of my boards, I go to my boards it's tab. It's there, right? Right. My second main tab is my music tab. So that has SoundCloud, that has YouTube, that has Spotify, that has everything open that I want to listen to. And then I open them task by task by task. Like, for instance, I think it was a couple days ago, I had about four different ones. I had one for my board. I had two from the R Compose board, different tasks open. And the best part of it is since I can rename these, I was able to rename them to either the description if it was short enough or the the name and number. Uh, So that was there immediately, and I knew exactly what that tab group was, and I could switch to it immediately without losing any other representation of my other tab groups. So I am over the moon that they they implemented this. And it's funny, you, you... I don't know about you, but I do see a lot of people just with 500 tabs open. Like, like the only thing you could see is like half an icon for every single tab. How are you supposed to remember what is what? What were you doing on that one all the way over to the left? I guarantee you, you've forgotten this by now. Bunch open. I have a bunch open. I, I can see the. It's based on the uh, favicon. It's just based on the icon. It's a. Uh... I got Bitwarden open, Fastmail. I see our logo out there. I got Twitch. I see Vivaldi. Bunch of GitHub. Well, and and the other thing I like, the other thing I like about Vivaldi's tabs is by putting them on the right hand side, I can activate the thumbnails, which actually gives me a preview of the browser page. So I don't even have to look at just the title. I can I can actually see the actual page where it is. Uh, by in the thumbnail or even if I highlight over it, it'll show me the entire page like zoomed in. So it is it takes away so much thought that I had to devote to tabs. It takes all of that away and gets completely rid of it. You know, if I if I'm doing something, I'm on that tab stack. If I need a context switch, then I visually context switch to a brand new tab stack. There is no if ands or buts or I'm kind of working on this and kind of working on that. No, 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 no. I am I am in here for for the long haul. So this is this is amazing. I am I am so happy and and this is even better I think because now I get a little bit more flexibility over the tab stacks that I create and the way to create them dynamically. And you know they they did a comparison the the Vivaldi blog the first link that I that I linked in the show notes, they do a comparison between Vivaldi, Brave, Chrome, and Firefox and talking about how you manage too many tabs in in Google Chrome. And, you know, there's extensions. uh, Google Chrome actually integrated tab grouping into the browser in 2020. So there is that functionality in Chrome, but it's not quite you you don't have all of the ability to have all of your tabs you know your your pin tabs or your important ones viewed at once right so so you can't have those stacks and once again i'm just i'm fangirling over here but man there is some excellent excellent architecture in the way they've they've developed this brave is the same thing because it's based off of chrome go figure too many tabs in firefox that one is actually a huge letdown because there's no real good way to to work it natively, especially natively. But you know, with uh, with Workana, I didn't even know that was a thing. But it lets you sort tabs into different groups or sessions. But you have to go into the Workana tab to open the different groups. Not sure. Um, I did try tree style tabs once upon a time. It's interesting, but it did not accomplish what I needed it to. It, it did not have that, that workflow, that grouping that I needed. And their, their multi-account containers, sure, they're privacy-focused, and they'll highlight your tabs differently, but they're not going to actually group your tabs. It's not the solution you're looking for. And I'll tell you what, that I'm looking at this uh, blog post, and it, it just looks so much easier to manage than having you know everything in one bar. You're able to click... The, the one tab and then under the tab, it's going to open everything else. Well, and I mean, if you're going to buy that pitch, you know, 
try shifting your tabs over to one side or the other of your browser because where is your screen real estate? Where is it? It's it's not vertical. Vertical is has never been the the long side of a computer screen ever. It's either been square or it's been rectangular long widthwise. And what do most websites do? They cut off like 30% of the screen and you have different, you, you know, they, they cut off 30% of the screen and you have padding like like for for the majority of your screen space. You're, you're obviously not taking that up. That's not being used. So why wouldn't you put your tabs on the right-hand side where you can see them, you can have thumbnails, it's, it's a much easier way to work with them. Not only that, but it's more visually representative when you have these two-level tabs. I, I think it maybe it's just I'm not used to it. I do not. I, I tried the thumbnails in Vivaldi. I tried Vivaldi, couldn't leave Firefox. I don't know what it is. I just don't know what it is. Now, the one feature I really love about Vivaldi is that you can get rid of tabs altogether. Oh yeah. You can just remove the tab bar and it's like, okay, well, why would I do this? But like, this is great for us. This is great for a screenshot, but in practicality, why am I going to do this one? Not only that, it has a built-in screenshot utility selling you on Vivaldi here. I'm doing a terrible job because I'm not selling you Vivaldi. I'm, I'm selling you the features because I'm such a fanger when it comes to that. I mean, it can, it can natively split the window. You can have a tiled window. Like, I can't tell you how many times it's helped me with uh, simply my time reports because I got three places where I'm tracking my project time and my meeting time and my other time, and they all go in different buckets, and I got a reference, and it's like, oh, I have four applications that I need to pull up. Bam, 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 bam. They're all right in front of my face. No hassle. I'm blown away every single time. Blown away. Not only that, but I can can have key binds that are – similar to or well the same key binds as tmux so i don't even have to learn any new key bindings to split windows it's just there for me as a natural extension of what i've already picked up so yeah it is it is the power user browser it it is it is just amazing the only other thing that i've seen come close especially when you're talking about these tabs is opera and for some reason, I think you're going to take this and run with this. I, I, I think that's a terrible idea. You should use Vivaldi. But Opera does have the, the workspaces option for managing tabs. So they do it uh, in order to uh, organize tab groups according to your interests and, and whatnot. You matrix guys. Blocks literally everything. It does the same thing as, as basically tab stacks does but it's it's a little bit more fun it's a little bit more customizable and it it does what a desktop does with workspaces with tabs and i'm like that's a tried and true method i mean a lot of people use a workspace to manage where they are on on their desktop you know why not with tabs too because they're mini applications anymore so might as well um so that's that's, I think, the closest competitor that Vivaldi is going to get to an actual sane version of managing tabs um, and, and working through that. But but honestly, I am all in. After this, I am all in on Vivaldi. I think they have, they have really nailed what needed to happen, and I am I'm over the moon about this. And I, I do believe in... In being there so that, you know, maybe I can be a force of change. And, you know, there's there's tons of cool tech and, and open source tech especially is becoming more and more important by the day. You know, we, we need to understand where it's at, where it's going, and and most of all, push it forward in the right direction. Now, we, we can't do that without help. So in order to grow and share the show, um, you can you always have the option to donate to the podcast at ourcomposedcast.com. Uh, that allows us to get the show out to those who, who need to hear it. And all, all of the donations will be going back into sharing the show and, and getting it out to, to where it needs to be. But for now, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks.